this week has been trying and difficult for so many. We've had so much rain that I have seen so many pictures of flooded backyards and basements, but I also want to thank you for the rain because of all the beautiful flowers and even the crops that we all need that will come from it. Lord, I would ask that you be with those that are hurting, those that are scared. I would ask that you bring them comfort and know that, let them know that you are with them. Lord, I would ask that you be with the leadership of this church, be with our pastor as he brings his message today. Please help us to have open ears and hearts to receive your word and your blessing. In Jesus' name I ask it all, amen. Our opening hymn today is number 86. It's How Great Thou Art. If you would please stand and sing with me.
then I shall bow in humble admiration and then proclaim, my God, how great Thou art. Sing it out now. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art. It's time for the children's story, and I see a lot of them sitting up there in the crow's nest. So come on down, and we're going to uh, have a story about mother's hands. They're on their way. Yeah. Come on up. Today I'm going to have you sit on the front row because I want you to be able to see some pictures about my story. Okay, so come sit over here. Okay, well, this story is entitled Mother's Hands. I want you to think about your mom's hands for just a minute. Well, this mommy up here and her little girl who looks a lot like Anastasia Bozik to me. I, when I saw that, it's like, boy, those are Anastasia's um, eyes. Um, they um, loved each other very much. And the little girl noticed that her mom's hands were different from all the other mommy's hands. Do you notice anything different about that mom's hands? Anything different? What do you think? It's different than the, the child is holding the mother's hand. Okay. Do her hands look a little rough? Yeah, something happened to her hands. And the little girl didn't think much about it until she started noticing that other mommies had nice, smooth, soft skin. But her mom's hands look kind of rough and rugged. Well, she asked her mom, what happened to your hands, mom? They're kind of ugly. That. You wouldn't say that to your mom, would you? But she didn't know. She didn't know. She said, well, everybody else's, their mommy's hands are smooth and soft. How come your hands don't look so nice? You think mom might have felt a little bit hurt? Maybe a little bit, but she had a story to tell her little girl. She said, when you were a baby, I did two things no one should ever do. But I didn't know any better. I made some mistakes. Well, one day you were sleepy, and I put you down for your nap. And I decided, you know, I would really like to visit with my neighbor. 
So I went out of our house and I locked the door and I just went just a few houses down to visit with the neighbor while you were sleeping. So we were talking and visiting and the time went by and then there was a sound that we heard and the, the guys upstairs. Oh dear. And when they heard that sound, they said, I wonder what's wrong. What do you think is wrong? Any ideas? What, what kind of sound was that? What does that tell you? That there's, a, that there's a fire. There's a fire. And so they thought, well, we better go outside and see. And they found the, saw the fire truck, but they thought, you know how it is. We always think it's not my house, not my house. But when mom looked, it was her house. Her house was on fire. I've got some really big eyes up here. <laughs> and so she started running toward the house because somebody very important to her was in that house. Who was that? It was her child. Her child is in that house. Well, the fireman saw her running and he told her, stop. Do not go in that house. And you know, he's right. Whenever there's a fire, you should never run back in the house. You should let them, the fire fires, take care of that. But the mom didn't listen to him. She ran straight into the house faster than he could get a hold of her. And she was able to rescue her baby. But when she did, she, her own hands were burnt pretty badly. You can see them bandaged up there. And so when the little girl heard that story, well now she's not so little, she said to her mom, Mom, I didn't know that's why your hands look so badly. And now I want you to know those hands saved my life. And so I think they're the most beautiful hands in the whole world. Well, that reminds me of a picture painted by Harry Anderson. This picture is pretty old because it's older than I am, so it's over 60 years old. But Harry painted this picture, and you can see a little girl, and she's pointing to something. What is she pointing to? What do you think? Over here, we haven't heard from any of the gentlemen this morning. What is she pointing to? Jesus' hands? She's pointing to Jesus' hands, and she asks him a question. Does anybody know what she asked him? He asked him, what is your hands? What's your hands in? Yeah, what happened to your hands? Well, Jesus will explain to her that he died on the cross for our sins. And when he did, some very cruel people put nails in his hands to hold him up on the cross. And do you know that Jesus still has those scars in his hands? Even after all this time. But I think that even though Jesus' hands have scars in them, that just like mom's, they are a symbol of love, those scars, and I think that they're the most beautiful hands in the whole universe. What do you think? Yeah, scars don't always look very nice, but sometimes scars are the result of somebody's love for another person. And so that's um, my story today about hands. Well, you've been excellent listeners, very attentive. And um, we're going to have a prayer this morning. Would one of you like to offer that prayer? Would you like to? Okay. Heavenly Father in Jesus, thank you for this day, and thank you for giving your sacrifice and how you stayed on that stake and did that for us because there was nobody else like you. Thank you, Jesus. We say this in your name. Amen. Amen. is here and you're going to collect um, an offering for the children. You guys know just what to do.
and as the children are collecting uh, your offerings, uh, which we're gonna go for our uh, school and daycare so that we can help other children. I would like to encourage those who are sitting comfortably upstairs, if you would like to join us here downstairs, it looks kind of empty, especially here in the front. Those of you who like sitting at the last two or three rows, would you please move forward? Because people are watching us online, we would like to, to give them the, uh, the impression that there are people here to listen to the sermon. Otherwise, they're, they're going to uh, just see uh, uh, my wife and Hannah and maybe uh, Tony on this side. Uh, uh, they're going to uh, see one or two people and that's it. So please, if the Holy Spirit is prompting you to move out uh, of uh, the comfortable uh, hiding places upstairs and in hiding places in the back, come forward. Let's encourage people because I see in our audience people who are watching us online from all over the world, people from Muslim countries, people from uh, countries where the gospel is uh, not allowed, but they have the internet and they are uh, able to enjoy our services. I've, I've seen comments from people from countries where they cannot uh, enjoy the gospels like you, you do. So let's give them the impression that they uh, here, appear here, they are people. Otherwise, when you're just sitting uh, upstairs or you're sitting far away from uh, the first pews, our cameras captures the first uh, uh, four pews. So basically, uh, all of you who are sitting uh, far back, they're not going to see you. Thank you so much for coming forward.
Thank you very much, Whitney. That was beautiful. And I can see your baby girl. She's so proud of you. And Leila, I'm proud of you. For I remember uh, ever since she was six or seven, she started writing on the yellow connection cards, I love Jesus and I want to be baptized. And at first I, I thought, well, this is just a, a little girl that uh, wants to fill the connection card. But she was serious. Every single Sabbath for, uh, for three years, she was filling these connection cards. And I said, wow, we have to do something about it. So one day we sat together with uh, uh, her grandmother and uh, uh, Whitney, and we talked about uh, her seriousness about being baptized. And I said uh, to her, uh, uh, grandmother Ruth Ann Harris said, Ruth Ann, would you mind giving her the Bible studies? I'm going to help you with whatever material she need, uh, you need. And she said, you know what? Actually, I'm going to write Bible studies my, my, myself. And this was true. Ruth Ann Harris wrote children Bible study, studies, and they're exceptional. I actually encouraged her to publish them. I don't know if she did that. Or you're trying. She really has to. They're really well done. They're very appropriate for, for this young age. And uh, so Ruth Ann studied together with uh, her baby, uh, grand baby girl, Layla. And it was uh, this year that Layla was baptized. So Layla, we are proud of you. And I'm still looking forward to this performance together with your mom. You promised. Okay? <laughs> Friends, for those of you who do not know me, my name is uh, Julian. I'm privileged to serve as the lead pastor of the Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church. And since some of you may be here for the first time, you're in the middle of a sermon series on the book of Genesis. And just to give you the feel of it, I would like to ask the team upstairs to dim the lights and let's enjoy our introductory video. Father, as we continue our study on the book of Genesis, we would like to invite you to, to be here, to hover over our hearts and minds, and to put in them divinely inspired ideas that will transform our lives. Please, Heavenly Father, join us here and bless us in the study of your word. In the name of Jesus, we ask, and all the people of God said together, Amen. What do you do when you're caught between a rock and a hard place? Let me give you an example. You work in a job that you do not enjoy. Your boss is mean no integrity whatsoever on his part. And oftentimes you feel like you're at the wrong place. You're unable to find another job, but you cannot quit this one because you need to pay the bills. So you stay. Today I would like uh, to preach to all of us a 
about a man who was caught in a situation like that. His name was Jake. And he was working for Uncle Scrooge, a.k.a. Uncle Laban. He was a mean boss, the pay was horrible, and the treatment was unbearable. Just to give you an idea, Laban promised to give his younger daughter Rachel to Jake if he works for him for seven years. And when the seven years were over, the morning after the wedding, Jake woke up next to the crossed eye daughter of Laban by the name of Leah. This was not what he was working for. Because he asked for the hand of Rachel. So Laban tricked him into working another seven years for the girl that Jake fell in love with. And when the 14 years of hard labor were over, Uncle Scrooge managed to keep the golden goose, a.k.a. Jake, under his roof and keep working for him, even though Jacob was so eager to go home. Today, I would like to look at uh, chapter 31 of Genesis. To look at the story of Jacob and to glean some practical lessons and insights for us. How to make decisions, how to make godly decisions when we are on the crossroads of life. How to make our decisions when we are caught between a rock and a hard place. And I have titled my message today, Time to Change Directions. Would you please grab your Bibles and let's open them to Genesis chapter 31. Genesis chapter 31, and thank you David for assisting with, with the microphone. I appreciate that you have long legs. You're going to reach any place in the sanctuary quick. So who would like to read for me? Genesis chapter 31, verses 1 through 7, and then skip to verses 14 through 16. Genesis chapter 31, verses 1 through 7, and then verses 14 through 16. Jacob heard the lab Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything our father owned and has gained all this wealth from what belonged to our father. And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude towards him was not what it had been. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Go back to your land, to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent word to Rachel and Lee to come out to the fields where his flocks were. He said to them, I see that your father's attitude towards me is not what it was before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I worked for your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me by changing my wages ten times. However, God has not allowed him to harm me. Then Rachel and Lee replied, Do we still have any share in the inheritance of our father's estate? Does he not regard us as foreigners? Not only has he sold us, but he has used up what he was paid for us. Surely all the wealth that God took away from our father belongs to us and our children. So do whatever has told you. Thank you very much, my young friend. You did an amazingly good job. Listening first to the kid's story and then reading for me the Bible verses. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. 
Now, time has come for Jake to realize that staying under Uncle Scrooge's roof is not safe anymore. So he decided to move. But I would like here to pay attention to what's happening, friends. How do you know when God is talking to you? Here in this passage and many other passages in the Bible, God is giving us God is giving us the advice to know how to recognize His will. And I hope you're going to pay attention now. God is talking to us today in the same way He was talking to the people uh, in the biblical time. And here are the four elements of recognizing God's voice. God talked to Jake and to us today, today through the witness of the Spirit within our heart. I'm going to explain in a minute. He talks to us through the circumstances of life. He talks to us through His Word. And finally, He talks to us through the human counsel of people around us. First, God talks to our hearts. Usually this is the first way in which God approaches us. Six years prior to this moment, six years before Jake left the home of Laban, God put in his heart the desire to go home. In chapter 30, verse 25, he wanted to go home six years earlier. And the one who, uh, who placed this desire in his heart was God himself. Oftentimes, this is how God begins talking to us. First, don't mistake it. No one of these four elements is God's voice by itself. You have to have all of them. Or at least three of them. So, God talks to us by impressing our hearts. By convi uh, convicting and convincing us. A persistent thought comes over and over and over again. And makes you uneasy at the place you are. The second thing... God uses the circumstances. His providence uses the circumstances of life. He either opens or closes doors of opportunities. Or sometimes he stirs the nest. Like the uh, mother eagle stirs the nest and kicks the, the baby eagle outside of the nest to teach it fly. In the same way, God sometimes stirs the places in which we are. Places where we have worked for decades and people liked us and everything was fine. And suddenly he makes the circumstances unbearable. This is not the only thing that you should make your decision on. But if he has also placed the desire in your heart to change directions, start listening. Thirdly, and probably the most important part, is God talks to us through his word. Unfortunately, the majority of Christians never listen to the Word of God. Actually, they don't, don't read it. They don't study it. Do you know that according to the Barner Research Institute, less than 10% of Christians, of people who claim to be born again Christians, that means people who claim to have active relationship with God, less than 10% study the Word of God daily. How are you going to hear the, uh, the voice of God if you don't study His Word? And when, when your heart convinces you, when the circumstances of life converge together with the Word of God, let me tell you how the, uh, the Word of God speaks to you. You read the, the Bible as you, as you do every day, and suddenly... There are verses jumping at you, ideas coming to your mind, overwhelming your conscience with convictions. And he's telling you a particular thing. And, it, and this thing that he's telling you through his word coincides and collides, goes in the same direction of the circumstances of your life and the conviction of your heart. I know that to many of you I'm, I'm speaking in Chinese or Greek, or whatever other language. Because you have never experienced it. And friends, I just want to let you know that as the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church by the name of Ellen White says, 
the science of salvation cannot be explained. It can only be experienced. God is not going to talk to you like, like that every day. The last time God spoke to Jake, previous to this time, was 20 years prior. But when you have to change direction, if you really love God, you study His Word, you are attentive to His voice, He's going to lead you. And finally, the, the, the fourth avenue through which God is going to reveal His will and He's going to complement these first three avenues is through human counsel. Sometimes people are going to come and cross your path and they're going to tell you the same things without you soliciting even uh, the, uh, the answer. They're going to tell you the same thing that will coincide with what you read in your Bible, with what your circumstances show you, and what your heart convinces you. When this happens, listen. It is time to change direction. And here is the first spiritual insight I would like to share today. God always leads His children. Did you hear that? God always leads His children. There are circumstances and, and, and uh, situations in life when you feel that God is not leading you, that God has deserted you, when you're going through divorce, or you're going through a terminal illness, or you're going through the loss of a job, of a friendship, of relationships, or you're living in a loveless marriage. But the Bible is clear on this subject. God always leads His children. But there is one condition. Did you hear the condition? If they are willing to follow Him. If you love God and you are willing to follow Him, God is going to lead you. And even the mistakes that you did in your life, God is going to use them as a stepping stone for success. If you love God and you listen to His voice. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ says it this way. My sheep hear my voice. Are you God's sheep? Are you listening? Are you hearing His voice? And then He says, And I know them. And they follow me. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Did you hear the last part? There is no one in this world, no principalities, no powers, no human agencies, no, no human beings, no your boss who is taking advantage of you, will be able to snatch you from the hand of God. God is going to lead your life if you are willing to follow Him. And there is no force in the universe that can touch you unless He allows it. And if He does, so be it. He is still going to lead you through the dark times of your life. Now let's read the second uh, portion of this text for today. Who would like to read for us in chapter 31, verses 17 through 32? Please lift up uh, your hand high so that uh, David can run up to you and hear your voice. So I see uh, Margie Hay is volunteering for us. We're going to hear your voice. This is a longer passage, Margie. Take a deep breath and uh, start preaching for us, verses 17 through 32. Then Jacob put his children and his wives on camels, and he drove all his livestock ahead of him, along with all the goods he had accumulated in Padan Aram to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household gods. Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban, the Aramean, by not telling him he was running away. So he fled with all he had, and crossing the river, he headed for the hill country of Gilead. On the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. 
Taking his relatives with him, he pursued Jacob for seven days and caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead. Then God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream at night and said to him, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country of Gilead when Laban overtook him, and Laban and his relatives camped there too. Then Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? You've deceived me, and you've carried off my daughters like captives in war. Why did you run off secretly and deceive me? Why didn't you tell me so I could send you away with joy and singing to the music of tambourines and harps? You didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye. You have done a foolish thing. I have the power to harm you, but last night the God of your father said to me, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you have gone off because you longed to return to your father's house, but why did you steal my gods? Jacob answered Laban, I was afraid because I thought you would take your daughters away from me by force. But if you find anyone who has your gods, he shall not live. In the presence of our relatives, see for yourselves whether there is anything of yours here with me, and if so, take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Margie. So that's the text. Now, do you know when you read a Bible text, how do you discover what is the, the central point of the passage? Repetition, yes. And one word that is repeated several times in this passage is stall, stall, stall. I, I've put on the screen, actually, the text has it uh, reads in Hebrew. It says in verse 19, Rachel stole the household idols. Actually, the, the Hebrew word is trafim. Trafim means uh, small to mid-sized figurines made out of wood or stone. She stole this uh, household idols of her father. And verse 20 says, And Jacob stole, in our translation it says, He stole away secretly from Laban. Actually, in, in Hebrew it says, Jacob stole the heart of Laban. So, obviously, this is the center of, uh, of this uh, passage that uh, Margie read so beautifully for us. What is, the, what is the message? First, I would like to start with uh, the theft of Jacob. Because it will explain why Rachel decided to steal. Jacob stole the heart of Laban. Uh, to steal someone's heart in Hebrew is an idiomatic expression that means uh, deceive someone. Deceive him very craftily. Pull the rug from under his, his feet. And he realizes that something is wrong when he's on the floor. What happened here? Yes, it was God's will for Jake to leave and to go in another direction. But it was not God's direction for Jake to do it clandestinely. Because by doing that, he gave the wrong message to his wives, and in particular to Rachel. Jacob believed in God for the most part, most of the times, except when he was between a rock in a hard place. Then, Jehovah was not enough. He had a, a small God. He had his old trafim, is the Hebrew word. It's his small idol figurine. And his small, uh, small idol that saved him when Jehovah was not powerful enough to save him was trickery, deceit, lies. Unbeknownst to Jake, by doing that, he gave the message to Rachel, who was half pagan. She was coming from a pagan family where they were worshiping these idols. He gave her the message, Jehovah is not enough. Sometimes he does not work. Sometimes you have to help yourself because he is not powerful enough to help you. Verse 
Verse 31 actually tells us why Jacob did that. He says to Laban, I did it because I was afraid. He did it, why? Because he was afraid. And here is the second insight from this story. Fear is the enemy of faith. Did you hear that? Fear is the ultimate enemy of faith. But furthermore, fear is contagious. It gave the message to Rachel that she has to have a safety net. And she decided her safety net is going to be the idols of her father. So she stole them. Just in case when Jehovah is not working, she can follow on the idols. And yet, when Rachel stole her father's figurines, idols, when she secured for herself the safety net, little did she know that these little gods put her whole family in danger. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons Laban pursued them so uh, adamantly, so hotly, is because he wanted to retrieve these gods. He believed that without them, he is without blessings. And Rachel put her family in danger. Let me tell you something, friends. Our own idols, our own little gods who have become our safety net, oftentimes put us and our family in danger. Further, furthermore, the Bible tells us that Rachel hid these little figurines, these little gods from, from Jacob. Jacob didn't know. J Jacob had no idea. And I would like to ask you, what are the little gods, what are the little idols of your life that you have hidden even from your husband or your wife? Nobody knows about them but you. What are the little gods that are so valuable to you that you are willing to put your own life and the life of your family in danger? Because our little gods always do that. They have the power to steal away the protection of God. And I'm talking here about the big God. The little gods we have made our safety net have the immense power to steal the power and the influence of the big God in our lives. But Rachel did further, uh, far, uh, far more than just jeopardizing her family. She jeopardized something that was much, much more important. Rachel's little gods stole away the dream of the big God for her. Let me explain. Who was the husband of Rachel? Jacob. And according to the Bible, Jacob is the grand-grandfather of the Messiah. The wife of Jacob was supposed to become the grand-grandfather, or uh, grand-grandmother of the Messiah. Who was the favorite wife of Jacob? Who was supposed to be the only love and the only wife of Rachel? Of, of uh, Jacob, oh yeah, sorry, gave the answer. Rachel. And yet she never became the grand-grandmother of Jesus. Do you know why? Because while her feet were on the way to the promised land, to the land of God, her heart was still in Mesopotamia. And as far as the Bible tells us, she never, she, while she was married to Jake, she never really married his God. She always remained a little bit pagan in her life. 
So the dream of God, the big dream of the big God, never came true for her. And God took her big uh, dream, God took the big plan for her life, and gave it to Leah. Do you know why? Well, while Leah in the beginning of her relationship with Jake be began on the wrong foot, and while in the beginning, in the first two children, she was competing uh, for his attention and she was trying to win his love, something happened between child number three and ch child number four. She changed perspective and it's revealed in the names she gave to the boys. And she called the fourth boy Judah. In Hebrew, Yehuda means praise be to Jehovah. Something happened between child number three and child number four. Her focus was not anymore on Jake. She focused her life on God. And do you remember through, through which of the 12 tribes came the promised Messiah? Judah. Do you remember who was the tribe that was uh, the priesthood of Israel? Le Levi. And both of them came through who? Through Leah. Rachel stole away from herself the big dream of God by clinging to her little gods. And this is the third insight of the story today. God's big, big dreams for us are often killed, are stolen away because we cling and we hide from everybody else, our little gods. And the Bible says, the hand of God has not become short, that he cannot help, that he cannot save, that he cannot do things in your life. But our sins, our little gods, has made his presence in our life powerless. Now I'd like uh, to, to get our fourth insight for today from this verse. In verse 29, when Laban finally overtook Jacob and his company, he says, I could destroy you, but the God of your father appeared to me last night and warn me, leave Jake alone. Actually, in Hebrew he says, my hand is like God. And my hand is the power of God. And I could have destroyed you. But the big God messed up my plans. As a matter of fact, when you read the Hebrew text, a few words are very key in this text. It says, Jacob fled, Laban pursued him, he overtook him, and he pitched tents. All these four uh, expressions are used in the Exodus story, when Pharaoh was pursuing the Israelites when they were leaving Egypt. All these words are expressions of intent to harm. Laban was on the pathway of war, but who stopped him? And I want you to remember that, friends. God stopped him. Finally, Jacob realizes all these 20 years of suffering, of seemingly being deserted by God, God has always been there. And he concludes his uh, speech to Laban, in which he gives Laban the tongue lashing of his life. He concludes his speech with this verse. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham and the fear of Isaac, had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction, he says, and the labor of my hand, and he rebuked you last night. Finally, Jake realizes something. God 
always watches over you. Do you, do you hear that? God always watches over you. Even when you are laboring for 20 years under the oppression of unfair boss. And you think that God has forgotten about you. God always cares about you. And when is the right time for you to leave, to move, to change directions, He's going to become visible, audible, touchable. God always watches over those who love Him. Even though it may appear to us that this is not true. God watches over you when you are receiving this, this unfavorable diagnosis by your doctor. God watches over you when you just failed your final exam. God watches over you when you just got the message that you are going to be fired. God watches over you when you do not know how are you going to make ends meet. God always watches over you. You told, you, you told God and you promised God you are going to love Him. Guess what? He's going to stay faithful to you and He's going to always watch over you. The shorthand of Jacob's story, of Jacob's life, can be summarized in this Bible verse. All things work together for good to those who love God. How many things? Oh, only the good things. When I'm successful in life, when I uh, have a successful career, when I have a job promotion, when I uh, got in this university and I got the scholarship, only then things work together for good. Is this what the text say? The text says all things work how? Together for good. Let me give you an illustration that probably is going to make it a little bit more palatable. How many of you like uh, uh, chocolate uh, cake? Some people like chocolate cake. Those of you who do not lift it up your hand, I know you. Uh, we have some members, and I know in particular Laura Hux. She's not here today. But she's one of those who does not like anything chocolate. No chocolate ice cream, no chocolate cake, vanilla. Go figure. But for those of you who like chocolate cake, let me give you the illustration. So here on the left are some of the ingredients that go in a good chocolate cake. You have some sugar, you have butter, eggs, baking powder, you have some uh, milk, uh, you have some cocoa powder and so on. Some of these ingredients are tasty by, by themselves. You can eat sugar, it's sweet. You can drink milk, it's, it's drinkable and it's enjoyable. But some of the ingredients are pretty uh, much unbearable by themselves. For instance, have you ever taken a uh, spoonful of, uh, let's say, baking powder and shove it in your mouth? Nice, right? Or a, a, a full spoon of uh, pure 100% cocoa powder. I'm not talking about this thing that you put in your milk in the morning and stir. It's mixed with sugar. This is why it tastes good. Just take 100% cocoa powder and shove it in your mouth. And I bet you, you're not going to be able to swallow it because it's horribly bitter. Or take a, uh, a spoonful of uh, flour, baking flour. Shove it in your mouth. Are you going to be able to swallow it? I bet you not. It's going to take all the moisture from your mouth. So you see, some of these ingredients by themselves are horrible. How in the world someone can create such stuff, right? But yet, mix them together, bake them under the right temperature, and you have a delicious treat. And God says, I'm the master baker. And I can make all things in your life, even those unfavorable diagnoses that you heard by the doctor, even the, those horrible divorce you went through, even those horrible things that happened to you, I can make them work together for good. Just don't be so quick to judge the product before you have seen what actually is going to look like. Because God is able to blend all these experiences of life, bitter and sweet experiences, and make them good. Because God is ultimately in control of the, of the lives of those who love Him. So what is the product? What is the good thing that is going to come out of it? Verse 29 tells us, to be conformed to the image of His Son. This is what the product God is baking. 
through all the things you're going through and you cannot explain, you hate some experiences and you ask, God, where are you? This is why. The ultimate product is for us to become like His Son. So, Apostle Paul says, all things work together for good. To whom? To those who love God. And let me remind you also what he also says right after that. Who, he asked the question, shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulations or suffering or distress or nakedness or unemployment or terminal diagnosis ever separate us from God? He says, sometimes we look like sheep destined for the slaughter. Yet, he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Because I am persuaded, he says, that neither life, nor death, nor principalities, nor powers, nor thing present, nor things to come, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is poured for us through our Lord Christ Jesus. Would you please take your yellow connection card. I hope you've put your name on the front of it and turn to the back and check at least one of these action steps. First one, I will be attentive to the leading of God's providence and to His Word so that I will know when to change directions in my life. Second, Lord, help me to break free from the chains of old habits and idols so that I can run free to my high calling. And third, dear Jesus, I believe that all things work together for good to those who love God, yet help my occasional disbelief, unbelief. May God bless us all. forward. Uh, it's time for our tithes and offerings. Um, I'm not going to stand up here and ask for money, but what I am going to do is stand up here and say, uh, as members of the Worthington Church, we are exceedingly blessed to have a magnificent facility, to have uh, so many wonderful ministries, a school, a daycare, so many other things uh, that we are blessed with on a regular basis. Uh, and, and most importantly, uh, as John tells us, uh, the, the light of God has fallen on all mankind. And we are continually blessed with His Spirit influencing us every minute of every day. As we are blessed, it's time to return a small portion. We bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of your Son and for the blessings that we received through this church. We ask, Lord, that you bless the tithes and offerings that come in uh, so that they may further uh, your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
pastor for such a wonderful sermon. Does everyone agree with me on that? This is, that was a beautiful sermon. Now our closing hymn is a great one. Hymn 100, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Stand with me, let's sing together. Sing it out. with me. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou for Sing it out now. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have been in thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in man in all witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Sing it out now. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Straight for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings of mine with ten thousand be high. Sing it now. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have need that thy hand hath provide. Watch me now. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto Thank you so much. Would you please bow your heads with me for the benediction? And now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before his presence in glory and in exceeding joy, to God who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.